The Cube at OpenStack Summit Atlanta 2014 is brought to you by Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. And Red Hat. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE. We're live in Atlanta for the OpenStack Summit. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined today with a special guest, Jean-Luc Chatelain, good friend, uh, industry legend. Uh, he's been around uh, many innovation cycles, booms and busts. Now the CTO of Data Direct Networks. Uh, Jean-Luc, great to see you. It's your hometown. Yeah, it's my hometown. <laughs> you have a farm. As you can tell by my accent. <laughs> we we be in sir. <laughs> Are we going to do that in French this time? <laughs> <laughs> we we could do some subtitles in English and talk in French. Yeah, you know, we can uh, do that. Yeah, you know, I'm a little rusty. Um, but it's great to see you. Um, so you have a farm out here in Atlanta, hit with a tornado. <laughs> Literally, the book, Inside the Tornado, we had uh, you know, Jeffrey Moore on uh, the Cube uh, at Service Now, Dave Vellante interviewed and wrote a book, Inside the Tornado. You were literally inside the tornado. I was literally inside the tornado, <laughs> two of them. And then you fact. crossed the chasm <laughs> to get to your house because it did, did the hole, okay. So that aside, great area, great to see you again. So um, you've been around the block, you've seen trends come and go, standards bodies get built up, taken down, some things work, some things don't. Open source is rocking, of course we love open source. But at the end of the day, business is business and you got to get deals done. Yep. What's this show like? What's your take on OpenStack? I and mean, obviously it's got traction, good foundation, good vibes. Yeah, it's interesting to see it evolve, right? I mean, we've been keeping an eye on, of OpenStack, on OpenStack at DDN since uh, 2010, roughly. Um, uh, it, it was interesting to see you know, how people starting to adopt it. Um, we're, we're kind of uh, sitting by the by the side of the, of the game field here, we're, we're no, really not a DevOps shop, right? So we're, we're just seeing how those trends are moving. Um, what we've been doing is more than watching what the hype says or what people are, are doing is really asking our customers, you know, what does it mean for you guys, right? Uh, and all traditional customers have not screamed up a stack, right? But that doesn't mean um, it's a bad thing. Uh, it just means that it's not yet applicable to the type of people we serve, right? But we don't serve your general purpose data center, I would yeah. say, right? Uh, so I've been quite impressed uh, on it's the It's a product. DevOps show, what do you mean by it's a DevOps show? I mean, DevOps, we know what DevOps is. You're saying it's not, it's not marketed as a DevOps show, you're saying that's just more the culture? I, I think it's a culture. Uh, it's, you know, this is, it, to me this morning, it was like a DevOps, Grand Mass, right? <laughs> I don't know who's the Pope, but, uh, uh, but it, you know, it's it's mainly after when, when you uh, you know when you hear the words that are being spoken, it's about speed, it's about agility, it's about it's about transformation of the data center, right? I mean, it's it's speed of deployment of application is being able to uh, quickly change configuration and be able to bring new application to the end user, which is a great thing. It's about evolving the kind of a stuffy, a little uh, uh, dinosaurish, you know, IT world. Um, but it feels to me that it's more about network and compute today than it's really about storage. Now, this is not to say that it's ignoring storage, but on top of mine, um, my impression is the majority of people are focused on, okay, how do I, you know, deploy so many VMs at the same time, transparently and in a very flexible manner so I can adapt my data center. Um, I said it was not applicable to us because uh, yet, um, because our customers are extreme. As you know, um, you're not generally going to find us you know, behind an exchange server or, or behind a traditional application, right? Uh, so the, the, the people we serve, the HPC community, whether it's you know, the, the you know, Argos National, the, the Argon National Lab or, or Oak Ridge, um, they, they don't come to us for what OpenStack is about yet, and then you know the intelligence community and and, other, and others, media and entertainment, um, they're paying attention to it, but that's not what they're asking of us, right? Um, so today, yeah, and so one of the things we were talking about, some conversation going on crowd chat right now from our previous guest, ex Gartner analyst, now working for Red Hat, Alessandro uh, uh, Pirelli, um, talking about we need to change the metrics. So I would agree with you. It is a DevOps show, and you know when you see contribution by lines of code as a core metric of success, you know that it's <laughs> certainly early and DevOps focused. That's what DevOps thing, hey, ship code. And that was last year's motto. 
boat with your code. So I get that. The issue is, that's not how businesses run. No. <laughs> they run on SLAs and this throughputs is cost of ownership, total cost of ownership, cost per gigabyte if you're in the storage business, you know, real metrics, penetration, market share. Right. <laughs> I mean, um, so with all that, how early is this market? I mean, you're, you guys doing big deployments and certainly in the storage area. Uh, we had David Wright on earlier from SolidFire. He's got an uh, all-flash array. Um, I still, uh, yeah, I think it's still very, very early, right? Um, for what I would, uh, again, for what I would, for my past uh, at Hewlett Packard, right, and dealing with a traditional enterprise, I, I think it's, it's still very early. Um, good progress very early. I can see some adoption in service providers, right? Uh, when you're a service provider, a lot of things can be done behind the scene, right? Uh, behind the curtain, as long as it does not affect the end customer. It, it's important. You can probably uh, reduce the total cost of ownership for uh, for the service providers. I'm not sure it's ready to be rolled into a very traditional IT department uh, and and be you know as readily adopted as the classic uh, type of technology. Um, little careful about things that claim to be free also, right? I mean, um, free is not free. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not hearing a lot about total cost of ownership yet. And you know, I said that back in December. Yeah, let's talk about the metrics uh, that you laid out. So in 2014 predictions, um, you had done a, uh, an interview with SiliconANGLE's writer. What were some of the predictions you had and, and how are they faring? Um, so I think one of the things I, I predicted is that. Hold on, I pulled up the list. I shared this earlier. Oh, you have this. that. Let me find it here. So oh my God, he's going to follow me forever. I bet I've been right. <laughs> John Luke, searching it. Here we go. Predictions. Okay. That's the first year I predict something, I better be right, or like I'm forever gone. All right, here we go. Predictions. Prediction number one, enterprises will keep drowning in data and starving for information and insights. Oh, it is so true. Um, uh, <laughs> I think that's going pretty good right now. Looking good off the tee, as they say, middle of the fairway. You know, it, it, it's, it's exactly that. They're still completely drowning in data and have little information. You know, only like 1% of information is really being extracted. Remember, it's early, it's only May. We're not even at the halfway point yet, but so okay. far it looks good. They're drowning in data. They're drowning. They're yeah. drowning, but you know, the, the biggest thing is you know, pulling that signal out, right? And, and uh, the drowning I is real. You know, I, I've met people spending from transportation company to a pharmaceutical, I mean, I have a good friend who is a, uh, a high level executive in a pharmaceutical company, and he, he just can't find anything, he can't find signal, and you would think that you know, those people, they live and breathe by data, right? And they're, but no, they're just still, so the, the whole, it's very real. I mean, it's very, very real that it's still done. And so the, the magic is how can you help as quickly as possible find that signal and, ex and get it out? But 1% of information being truly exploited is not enough. Right? Yeah, and that's going to be low latency, real-time analytics, certainly cloud will help. That's coming out of OpenStack here is that analytics are a great use case for the cloud. Gr great use Putting case. Putting stuff out there and then having it you know, right. kind of come in. Second prediction, number two, enterprises will want to do big data projects while their little data issues are still not resolved. You sound like a psychologist there. Their little data issues are not yet resolved. What but, do you mean by that? But I, I mean that, you know, um, B big, uh, there's too many definitions for big data. I'm not going to go down that, that route, but you know, if we say that big data is kind of machine-generated data plus you know, s social type data and all this, you know, I see a lot of customers saying, I've got a big data problem, I've got to solve it. And, and you ask a question, I mean, are you, are you just did, are, have you taken care of your little data, meaning your transaction data, which is very well known, very That's well what structured? That's all the doing. Uh, yeah, that's all they're doing. Right? That's all they do. That's he didn't. He did not agree with that. But we'll yeah, they don't. So, so I mean, he I'm said no. We do it all. I, I know. And I yeah. okay. I, I don't want to start controversy, but yes, that is. He's a Georgia Tech alum. Don't go hard on him. <laughs> <laughs> CEO from yeah, SolidFire, uh, Dave uh, Wright. Yeah, uh, you know, I know. I was Amory, so that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's. You know, what he said is, you know, data silos and then uh, in the future or in the new world, right, all data will reside on scale out database. I'm just asking the question, what do we do with the instruction? I data? asked a question, right. I asked a question. He said, 
No, we do it all, but, but really dissecting his answer, maybe he, he was not thinking properly, but it's transactional. I mean, that's essentially, yeah, that's, so that's, that's relational databases, that's stuff in right. memory. That's but, but even that today, it, I don't think people are extracting as much as they could out of that very well-structured data. So before you tackle a big data problem, right, make sure you've taken care of your little data, or at, or at least you've got a plan for it, because otherwise you're going to be chasing this, you know, this horse. And the the little one. data might be hiding in the big data, I too. You know, at the end of the day, both are useful. Um, you remember our, our talk three years ago, right, where I told you, you know, Transactional data give you context, and un unstructured data, non-transactional data, gives you sentiment. And it's both together give you the truth, right? Because, you know, context with sentiment is powerful. Next, next prediction, software-defined everything hype will increase in total ignorance of where and when hardware and software tight coupling makes sense. So Sage. Mark, Risen, Mark Risen Hopkins was actually pointing this out, and he, he didn't think it was overhyped based on the quote that the guy from Ceph, who ink, uh, ink Tank sold to Red Hat, he was like, it's completely BS. So he's agreeing with you. Today on theCUBE, he said that. Uh, you know, that was music to my ear. <laughs> that was music to my ear because, you know, you would think of the guys from Ceph being like software defined. They everything. are software defined. They are all right. about software um, defined, right? So I was waiting for somebody to speak about software defined software anytime soon, right? But it uh, <laughs> hasn't been done yet. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the reality is, you know, for the past, Year, you know, 10 years, a lot of storage has been software working in conjunction with hardware in order to deliver a given quality of service. Now, where I would knock people on is you know, people that sell you a right array with a full of ASIC and telling you they're software defined storage. No, they're not, right? I mean, but the moment you've got, you know, thousand line, 100,000 line, a million, we've got two million lines of software on our arrays, right? We're software-defined storage, if you want. But I'd rather think we're just you know, the right solution, right? Yeah, well, Mark Hopkins was saying on, on our crowd chat, well then, if you, if you think that's BS and you're calling it out on it, and so did the guy from Ceph did, then all, all data is big data. All data is big data. Well, big data is all data, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, you're right. It's like, okay, so Mark, you're right on that one. So in a way, it's, you know, it's, okay, next prediction. Um, Commodity and open source everything pundits will still live in blissful ignorance of a little thing called TCO. Oh, that's what I said a minute ago, total cost of ownership, right? It's, it's not because something I give you is free, right? That running that thing is going to be free. This is what Red Hat's fighting for earlier on. We had the analysts on this, now it works at Red Hat. This is what IBM and HP all recognize is that total cost of ownership is the game, that is the metric. At the absolutely. end of the day, everything else is BS. Absolutely. I'm going to write that on the crowd chat. Yeah, right. I absolutely think that's totally the case. Whether you call it the shark fin or the, the tip of the iceberg and underneath that, that, that line is, is right. the real cost, right? right. So, so, huge deal. Yeah. It's hard to really calculate what total cost of ownership it's, is. It's hard because of the soft cost, of course, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it is a game, right? And, you know, I, back in the days I when I was in the, uh, in the email archiving market at large scale, uh, I was telling customers that I could give them the storage. They will still pay, right, to get that storage managed. So I don't think anything has changed. The total cost of ownership is about how much it costs to run something, right? And Open source everything and everything is free. Sorry, I've been around the block too long. That's it, that's all I predicted now. There's got to be another one. Okay, I'm just writing this down. Overheard on the cube. Go to crowdchat.net if you want to participate. I thought you were on your Facebook page. Hmm? No, you're really working. I thought yeah. you were on your Facebook page. No, no, <laughs> I, well, I, po I don't post to Facebook anymore. <laughs> People still use the say. Prediction number five, EDW economics will still be poor, drive, ETL for data reduction and inflexible model fit, hence derive faulty insights. So enterprise data warehouses will not have a good value is what you're saying. Yeah, so what I'm saying here is the traditional EDW uh, as defined by, I won't name any vendors, but everybody knows what traditional EDWs are, uh, have a storage cost which is astronomical, right? Um, you know, numbers that would scare you and and that storage cost has driven, which is an economic model, has driven um, a lot of people to not be able to put all the information that they need inside their EDW to attract the signal. In fact, 
a lot of time in an EDW, you put subset of data or sampling of data because you can't afford, economically speaking, to put everything. So I, I, I've said it many times, to me, extract, transform, and load, which really is really um, extract, torture, and lose. So, but what's really interesting is that there is an emergence of the BDW, uh, the business data warehouse, and Hadoop is a great component of that. So Hadoop, I've said it many times, is not an analytics platform, but it's an important component in the analytics platform. And what Hadoop is bringing in that space, that revolution, you know, giving a revolution there, is that it allows people to keep all of the raw data that they need right, in order to then do their analytic work. And that the business data warehouse is going to obfuscate the EDW from a amount of data that they keep and where people do lots of analytics. This is not to say that EDW will disappear because you know, compliance data and, and referential data may still sit there. Last prediction, the big data universe will have a giant black hole into which security, privacy, and GRC, which stands for Globe Governance, Risk Management, Compliance, have fallen and will stay. Yeah. And I would what, add security and privacy to that. Security, privacy, and GRC have fallen and will stay. What cool. do you mean have fallen and will stay? What do you mean by that? Meaning I don't see a lot of motion around um, tools to enable governance, to enable good privacy and good security around big data. You know, you and I, um, I think we had lunch a year ago and we talked about the sh shadow data, you remember? The yeah. sh shadow data, right? And so. I'm concerned that in the world of big data, uh, people are going to be capturing feeds from thing, you know, social networks and all this, got to have information about consumers, um, which agree, the consumers are giving freely today, but uh, which privacy is not really considered. So um, there is a, a big void on tools around helping an enterprise you know, have awareness of the risk and then the compliance issue uh, with big data. And none of the tools that I see today are designed to the scale at which they need to be designed in order to handle big data. So it's, it's still a black hole. It's making progress, but it's still a black hole. All right, so we're going to end, end the same. We're up on time here, but I want to just get your thoughts on um, industry consolidation and during growth. So we heard that the trough of disillusionment is coming in the cloud. Um, from the Gardner guy in terms of OpenStack. And, and all big stuff. data too, by the way. And big data too. Is right in the middle of it. <laughs> it's right in the, yeah, I mean, thank God you know, everyone's doing all their M&A deals now. But So th this is going to bring opportunities, right? So Intel made a huge purchase, I mean, a huge investment in Cloudera. Right. Uh, purchase, it seems to come out of my mouth. It's, it's yeah, like yeah, I've been thinking about that's it. That's a wishful thinking. <laughs> you know, it's practically a purchase <laughs> in my mind. But, you know, uh, it's a huge valuation. It's over the top, it's uh -huh. insane. But, but um, um, they're betting on the future and the big bet that is. In this space around OpenStack, do you see consolidation? Who will, you know, what do you, what's your experience? And, and if you, you've been on the M&A side, certainly at HP, you were a big part of the strategy over there when you were in the CTO office, um, and you're obviously an industry luminary now. What do you see for the uh, buyers and the sellers? Who's yeah. buying, who's selling, who needs to buy, who needs to sell? You don't need to name names. If you want to name names, No, I great. don't want to name names because it's, 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 this would be, you know, looking crystal balls and, you know, I don't shine it every morning, but, um, oh, a big picture though, who's well, the buyers? From a big picture, clearly. Is it a buyer's market or seller's market? It's going to be a buyer's market, right? Um, we, we, we're probably on the beginning of the trough of disillusion, then right smack in the middle for the cloud, my, my gut feeling. Uh, but I think the buyers are going to be the 800 pound gorillas that are being threatened, right? I mean, I would not want to be sitting on, you know, 10 million lines of code to do virtual machine provisioning in a proprietary manner, right? Would you? Because no. these guys, right? All the 4,700 gigs are out there, right? They're going to use things like, you know, I was very impressed by what the guys from Ubuntu talked about, right? The, the automated provisioning that they have and all the this. The juju. The juju, right? Yeah, the I mean, I, th I think this is great stuff, right? Um, and there's another one called SoulStack. You know, yeah, B really, really interesting. He's a great stuff. guy. He was on the queue as well. Right. So I think that um, the big guys are going to keep an eye very, very close on what's happening here, and they're going to need to own them. Right. Otherwise, they're going to get commoditized. 
What do you think about uh, storage? Obviously, pure storage is valuation. I mean, um, le legit or over the top? Do you think they have any chance to be the next EMC? No. <laughs> Welcome to the bubble. Right? Um, you don't think they have a chance to be the next EMC? Pure storage? Yeah. Not a chance. What's, what's holding, what's going to, uh, what, what do you think, you how, know, how is it going to play out? Give us your forecast on that. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't like extremes, right? So all disk is not good, all flash is not good, a little bit of good, is, a bit, little bit of both is interesting. Uh, there is no such thing as one size fits all, right? Uh, there are places where pure um, SSD solutions are very applicable to accelerate some application. There are places where the economics are not going to work because of the size, the amount of data that you have, or the type of profile that you have. Um, I'm really more looking at, you know, I'm a big fan of non-flash solid state, right? So I do think that in term, the next generation memory technology are going to usher a transformation. And the transformation would be that uh, enough solid state memory will be close to the application that the traditional storage will be relegated to the archive stuff. So that's, that is, that's what I see. But it's not going to be an SSD play. It's going to be a direct to PCIe or whatever the bus of the, you know, the, the, the CPU bus of the, of the time is going to be. Lots of solid state uh, technology, whether it's PCM, STRAM, or VRAM, we can argue that till the cars come home. Right? I got my preference, but you know, yeah. Intel has others. Um, but you know, lots of memory close to the CPU, um, a programmatic model, or programming model that move from uh, you know, file read and file write to malloc and free, right? uh, and then storage taking a back seat as being the archive of all that. Um, well, Scott Tensor's got a big vision. I mean, I like him. I like his mojo. I like what they're doing over there. Um, but EMC just bought DSSD. What did you think about that move? Did they buy people and IP? I'm, I'm trying to, I mean. That's not their normal mo move. That's I mean, not their normal move, but I think they're probably, you know. Given Extreme IO's de you know, demand, they need to kind of bolt something in there. Yeah, right? I think they needed, uh, they needed patents and, and they needed smart people. Yeah, right? they it certainly it got it with that it deal. Could, it could also be defensive, yeah. right? Right, um, it feels like they got the cool kids, right? Yeah, it's a great team. I don't I know, mean, have you seen the product? I have not. No, I, mean, I, lo I love the presentation. Jeremy Burton did a great job at EMC. Okay, the last question I want to ask you is, I ask everyone is, why is this point in history in the tech business so exciting? You've, again, been through many innovation cycles, booms and busts, um, and hypes and bubbles, and so you've seen a lot. Um, yeah. Compare this moment in time, why is it out there? Tell the folks out there in your own words, what this is all about, why is it so exciting, why are people all jazzed up? Um, well, I can tell you why I'm jazzed up. Uh, I'm, I'm jazzed up about value extraction, right? So I, can, I think it's a great moment because we are at the moment where information becomes the currency of the enterprise, right? And we are changing how we make decisions. The, um, the, we're going to get to an era of data and information during decision, right? Uh, powered by big data. So that, to me, excites me. Um, ultimately, infrastructure is uh, being simplified and automated. Uh, there's, on some aspects, I think we're rebuilding the mainframe sometime. You know, the, the cloud is all virtual, is it all virtual, all automatic, you know, partitioned everywhere, virtual partition everywhere. Sounds like a giant mainframe. To I mean, me. you and I have talked about this m years ago. The systems guys are back. The old school dudes like yeah, us yeah, yeah. are back yeah, in, yeah. in vogue. Yeah. You know, I mean, hell, you know, we, it's, it, it's a mainframe. It's like an operating system. The web uh, is now you're right. It's, it's complete a giant mainframe. System. I mean, yeah. APIs are subsystems, right? I pulled out my JCL book the other day. <laughs> and I mean, maybe we can you know, put that on resume. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, data centers, not just data centers, but now if you look at the, the cloud, the cloud is a distributed network, right? It's connected. You got some you know, compute everywhere, you got virtualization. I mean, why not just create one big massive yeah. system? Yeah, it's what's funny because we broke the mainframe, right? We, we tore it apart during the open system time and then we got all those parts and we put them together and it was good because it brought in, you know, standardization and open system and all that. And then we realized that putting it together and keeping it working is really expensive and it's kind of nice when they all like 
unified. So maybe we're rebuilding the mainframe of this. You know, I, I'm personally excited. I would agree with you. I think I'm excited because what you said, wealth uh, extraction, I think, or value extraction, I, I think it's a wealth creation op opportunity for entrepreneurs, I think. You look at OpenStack and why I'm, I'm not too hard on the OpenStack, I want to see how this thing plays out. It's still baking in the oven, in my opinion, but there is some serious wealth creation, value creation opportunities, not for, and for customers, which would then gets rewarded to the companies who create that value for customers. I mean, industries are created this way, and I think, right. I think you're going to see some new industry formations that's going to create a new cast of characters, new players. Yeah. Um, some old ones will fade away, stay around, but I just think it's a great, if, if you're an entrepreneur, the, the chips are on the table. Yeah, it's really on the table, and you know, and we can do good thing with it. That's what I really like about it. I mean, I'm seeing the, the, the you know, what information enable right, in underprivileged countries like Africa, for example, where we can bring you know, what you and I consider as normal to the fingertip and some kid in the, you know, in, in the desert that can now have access to this and the enablement and the, the all the- The globalization is amazing. The globalization of the use of information for yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of information that's not used for good, but you know. We sing kumbaya it's here in the queue, it's kumbaya, but I, yeah. I think, it's, I think it's, it's true. I mean, this is all about relationships. Social media certainly is doing that. Yeah. Um, John Luke, great to see you on the Cube. As always, great segment to see you, hear your predictions and looking out there on track and your insight into the storage uh, activity and, and certainly OpenStack predictions here. This is the Cube. We're right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you.